everyone uh, we are carrying on with our section on project management and food manufacturing and this week we have been um, introduced to the theory of constraints with Eliyahu Goldratt's uh, theory which he introduced to the public in his uh, business novel <laughs> I'm going to call it that because it was written very much in a novel type format so that it would be easy to read and very accessible to all sorts of different uh, managers working in a variety of different fields. And it's one of the most published business books in the entire world. And Eliyahu Goldratt's uh, Theory of Change, or, or Theory of Constraints, pardon me, was focused on how do you think through manufacturing systems to optimize and uh, increase throughput so that you have maximum profitability. And these same uh, theories he put into a second novel called The Chain, and he uses that specifically with respect to project management. And so I highly recommend that you take a look at those books. And for those of you who are following along in Niagara College's uh, uh, process engineering class, this uh, section on project management is, a, is, we do have some videos directly from the Goldratt Institute and videos of Eliyahu Goldratt uh, presenting his own work. Um, and I highly encourage you to uh, take a look at that because he's going to be representing it far better than I ever could. That said, at the end of this video, you will be able to uh, use the five focusing steps. And so you will evaluate a work plan schedule and identify a constraint in your work plan. You'll discuss fact-finding strategies that can be used to exploit the constraint and use existing resources more efficiently. You'll define methods of subordination to the constraint or using existing resources to maximize the constraint's throughput. You'll determine a strategy to elevate the constraint or add capacity to the constraint. And you'll appreciate that new constraints will emerge over time, so this process is continuous. And to use Goldratt's words, do not let inertia become the constraint so we've been revisiting the slide over and over again. We're really focusing from a, from a project planning perspective at this point. We're moving into the implementation phase, but we're really thinking seriously about risk assessment and feasibility, that constraints are what are the, the Achilles heel, the, the problem that slows everything down in the success of projects. And inevitably on any project, you want to be completing on time and on budget. And that is absolutely critical. So we talked in a previous slideshow about how so much of what we do is based off of our projections on time. Later on, we'll have a unit on financial, but we often sit and project on time. And there's so many things that make the duration of our projects run longer and longer and longer. And so uh, what we did in our previous videos, we did Gantt charting and chart or CPM mapping of our projects so that we were able to identify if there were time related constraints based off of our probability of occurrence and duration of different times. Now some of the different factors that are going to be impacting we really can't quantify in a in a CPM chart. Um, things like who are the people who are doing this project? Are they brand new graduates who are very inexperienced and therefore um, are extremely variable or are they senior managers who have been around for a long time and able to be extremely reliable on their projections? Are they also individuals who are capable of handling the, the multitasking um, effects or the, uh, pardon me, the Parkinson law effects that could be occurring when it comes to projection of how long a task will take and how reliably they can do that task accurately and effectively so that you're moving on to future tasks. Other things too, we in our in our PERT charts, we aren't doing a full-on mapping of resources, but it's important to think about moving ahead, and we will talk about this. When doing mapping of projects, you will need to start doing resource mapping, where you start to say, you know what, I can't be one person in five different places at the same time. I can, as one person, 
can only be working on one task at a time and I only have so many hours in the day to be able to accomplish those tasks. Same with resource planning that let's say you need to be using a machine to accomplish your project. You cannot have that machine running two projects at the same time necessarily. That machine may have to be run in sequence and there are only so many hours in the day to run that machine. So you do need to start thinking about resource planning and we'll talk about that in another in another slideshow. Now in the in the theory of constraints five focusing steps again no surprise there's five steps identify the constraint exploit the constraint subordinate everything to the constraint elevate the constraint and prevent inertia from becoming the constraint and if you can hear some noise in the background I happen to have a visitor in the room and she's having some cereal and that's okay she's going to continue having her cereal and I she's going to empty the dishwasher so you might hear hear that in the background um the fun of working from home. <laughs> she says I should get myself an office. I was here all day long. She just walked in, that's all right. So first off, we're gonna identify the constraint. What is the step in our process that is slowing the throughput of our project down? And the same five focusing steps, I'm gonna say this right now, it, is, it works the same in manufacturing production. So we will re revisit this at a later point in the semester, but what is it in our process that is slowing things down? I'm going to jump out here and remind us uh, of our CPM mapping. Oop, let's pull the, this one here. If you remember from a different video, we did a CPM mapping of a food product development project, and we were making mochi ice cream. We CPM mapped it out, we did our critical path, and we identified in our critical path that these red highlighted boxes the duration on this step was severely hampering our throughput. And in the case of the red box, it just happened to be that it was working with our supplier and the, the reliability of that supplier to get our ingredient on time that was slowing our process down. At that point in time, you recall, I said, what would happen if we made one functional change and we projected in advance that we were going to order from the supplier once and only once we changed the duration of our project from it's 29 right here so we subordinated we ordered everything that we anticipated in advance of our project rather than here where we ordered three times we went from 50 days originally projected down to 29 days. So we shaved 21 days off of the duration of our project. And if you are paying salary for people, whether they're working or not, you just saved a lot of money on this project because you've saved 21 labor days on this project. So let's jump back to thinking about what did we just do? So. We identified the step in our process that slowed our project down. In this case, in the case of our mochi ice cream, based off of our CPM mapping, it was ordering our supplies from our um, ingredient supplier and the long duration that it took to get those supplies to us. In an, and so the next piece of the puzzle is how do we exploit that constraint? What can we do with our existing resources to maximize the potential of the existing system? So I did make the suggestion, what would happen cost-wise if we were to anticipate every ingredient that we thought we would need and only order once from our supplier? That we were able to shave off quite a number of days from our project plan and speed everything up. Now, I want to jump back out here and let's go back to this plan here. Here's another key question that we could be asking. What would happen if we were to change how we interacted with our supplier? Note 10 days and 10 days is our subordination to the step E in this project. What would happen if, if we were to find a supplier that was capable of doing overnight shipping and that 10 went down to, let's say two or three days. That's quite a considerable change in the throughput on this project. And so, when it comes to exploiting our constraint, we were able to go back in and say, based off of our 
relationship with supplier A, it takes on average 10 days. With supplier B, it takes on average three days. Uh, with supplier C, it takes an average of seven days. We could be collecting what is the typical turnaround time on suppliers and decide, you know what, based off of the efficacy of this project, and we also can anticipate that if they can supply us quickly, they will also have a really solid supply chain when it comes to full-on manufacturing. But those are the sorts of data items that we could be collecting to help us make our decision. Let's not work with supplier A because it takes 10 days, or let's see if supplier A will do expedited shipping because they feel that this is a, luc a lucrative project. Let's see if we can exploit the constraint and look at different angles to speed up and increase the throughput on that. Perhaps you're working on a different project uh, and you've identified the constraint in your project to be, I don't know, maybe it's the production trials. What could you be doing to speed up production trials or improve the efficacy on your production trials? Is it that you need to have more expert advice in there to help focus in and make sure that you are doing it effectively? Is it actually going back to your design of experiments to make sure that you have a really, really effective and high impact production trial so that you're minimizing the number of iterations that you need to be doing? All sorts of different ideas, but reflect back on your uh, CPM map to be able to identify potential constraints. And I realized that in this class, we're doing a lot of thought exercises and we're just thinking in our heads about imaginary manufacturing scenarios. But think realistically about what are some of the different um, things that slow down your projects when you're working on them. You've worked on enough different product development projects with us to be able to think what slows you down. Let's go back to my slides here. In some cases, it makes sense to slow down other parts of the project. That's what we call subordination to the constraint. And so if there's one aspect of the project and the team and the resources that is way faster, then in many cases, it's, it's worth slowing everything else down on the rest of the project, and it opens up those resources to be able to do other things. In other cases, you might be working to build a buffer around that constraint. And so that way you can keep working consistently, but you're not overworked at the same time. Now, you could argue that the strategy that we had here was a bit of a subordination strategy, that rather than touch or have, have three touch points with our supplier, we focused on having one single touch point with our supplier and we would order in everything and everything. If you recall from the previous slideshow, I said, if we are saving 21 days worth of labor, we may be able to anticipate and buy out all our supplies here. And we may even just project out and say, you know what, we think we might need this, and while we don't know exactly for sure until we get to a later point in the project, just the cost savings on labor is going to be worth buying the ingredient or buying this, uh, the samples to speed up the entire project. Sometimes you can make those justifications and have less touch points or less, uh, less operations within a project to be able to take advantage and subordinate the constraint. Let's move back to our slides here. Sometimes you can elevate the constraint and that's where you're adding extra capacity. So in some cases you might need to buy another machine or hire in another person to make that constraint get minimized. But always make sure that you've done the other three steps first. Don't throw money and resources at a constraint until you've identified that you've got capacity elsewhere. So I've seen it happen in projects before where things get slowed down and people just start saying, well, let's buy this, let's buy that, let's buy it. And, and honestly, sometimes it just is, you know what, the, the most cost-effective thing is just to slow down and wait. Always make sure that you've done the other steps first to make sure that you are not just throwing money at a problem, but that you're really justifying elevating the constraint and adding additional resources to it.
Last but not least, using Goldratt's words, do not let inertia become your constraint. So many times within organizations, um, doing this sort of continuous improvement-based evaluation on projects or on manufacturing processes, people get so used to doing things the way they are and people just say, you know what, nothing's going to change, so let's not even try anymore. Don't let that happen. We talk about innovation, we talk about change management. It's so critical to have that ability to be open and be able to move, be able to pivot, be able to make changes. And so don't become inertia, be innovation, be a change maker, be open to having those conversations. The challenge is that as much as it's just about systems, it's also about personality conflicts and ego. And so you've got to be able to step outside of those aspects and say, wait a second, we as an entire organization are focused on continuous improvement. And so we are open to having these hard conversations and open to having the, uh, the ability to say, you know what, things do need to change. So as much as theory of constraints is about functionally analyzing the system, sometimes it's human factors within the system that become the constraint. And in many cases, it can be personality conflicts and ego that become the issue. Big thing about uh, TOC and focusing is that new constraints always emerge as soon as old constraints are resolved. So you can't go in and do a singular TOC type project where you say, let's do a TOC review and find uh, our constraint and we'll fix it and everything will be great. No, as soon as you change the balance within your manufacturing system or within your project management, something else is going to shift. And Inevitably, Murphy's Law is going to come and get you, and you will need to reevaluate on a routine basis to make sure that you are identifying the new constraints and modifying your focusing steps so that those new constraints are resolved in quick succession. So if we were to go back to our mochi ice cream, let's say we modified our constraint here. We found a new supplier. We were able to reduce the delivery on our supplies. Now our constraint is step E, which is production trial. And we're looking at, so production trial and product refinement become our new constraints. And so here's where we need to use expertise in uh, formulation to be able to go in and really hit that formulation really quickly using good food science background, good food chemistry, good understanding of technical ingredients, to be able to refine that formulation step and do it really critically and really effectively. This is why I keep saying that uh, the food scientists at Niagara College are ninjas because we are training them in all of these different elements at the same time. If you are a really good and effective project manager and doing product development, you are not just looking at your formulation. You are also thinking simultaneously about food safety and uh, process validation. You are thinking simultaneously about uh, shelf life extension and so on. And so these constraints, yes, you are new professionals and you are new to the field, but the more you keep doing this and the more you keep practicing, the more you are going to be able to do all of these simultaneous types of thinking at the same time. I love you guys. You guys are awesome and keep on asking good questions. I will talk to you soon and Always glad to hear from you. Take care.